Let me extend a very warm welcome to this Gifford Lecture at the University of Edinburgh. My name is Stuart Brown. I'm Professor of Ecclesiastical History and Deputy Convener of the Gifford Lectureships Committee. And for those who might be watching this online, we are in the historic Playfair Library. Allow me to say a few words about the Gifford Lectures before I introduce our lecturer. The Gifford Lectures were established in 1885 by a gift from Adam Lord Gifford, who was a justice of the Court of Session and a man of broad learning and cultivation. He endowed a series of public lectures at each of the four older Scottish universities, Edinburgh, St. Andrews, Glasgow, and Aberdeen. And they were, the lectures were for promoting the study of natural theology, with natural theology defined broadly as the knowledge of God and the foundations of ethics or morals. And at the University of Edinburgh, past Gifford lectures have included such luminaries as William James, Henri Bergson, James G. Fraser, Albert Schweitzer, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Iris Murdoch. Our Gifford lecture this evening brings added luster to this very distinguished company. She is Sheila Jasanoff, the Fortsheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Professor Jasanoff is an internationally acclaimed scholar of science and public policy whose pioneering work explores science, technology, and the public reason in modern democracies. Professor Jasanoff was educated at Harvard University and the University of Bonn. She taught for some 20 years at Cornell University, where she was the founding chair of their Department of Science and Technology Studies, before she was appointed in 1998 to a professorship at Harvard University. At Harvard, she founded and leads the program on science, technology, and society, as well as the Science and Democracy Network. She has held distinguished academic appointments in North America, Europe, and East Asia, and she has lectured widely around the world. She has acted as consultant to science policy organizations, including the European Commission and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. She is a former Guggenheim Fellow and a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and she has received numerous honors in Europe and North America. She is the author or editor of 15 books and over 100 learned articles and contributed book chapters. Her books include Controlling Chemicals, 1985, Science at the Bar, 1997, The Fifth Branch, Science Advisors as Policymakers, 1998, Designs of Nature, Science and Democracy in Europe and the United States, 2005, and Science and Public Reason, 2012. Her next book, The Ethics of Invention, Technology, and the Human Future, is soon to be published. Now this year, the University of Edinburgh celebrates the 50th anniversary of the foundation of our Science Studies Unit, and we are especially pleased that Professor Jasanoff will help us to commemorate this important anniversary with her Gifford Lecture. The lecture this evening is being recorded, and the video will shortly be available online on the Gifford website. Professor Jasanoff, could I now invite you to present your Gifford lecture entitled Cosmopolitan Visions, Science and Reason in a World of Difference. Professor Jasanoff.
Thank you, Professor Brown, for that gracious introduction, and thanks to the Gifford Committee for the uh, humbling opportunity to speak under the same name of a lecture series that uh, has hosted so many luminaries, as you said, before me. It's an extraordinary honor and privilege to be speaking here tonight under the auspices of the Gifford Bequest on a topic that I think is close to the founder's intent, although not precisely within his imagination at the time these lectures were endowed. Lord Adam Gifford's will, as you have already heard, refers to the subject matter that he co contemplated in very expansive terms, redolent of his era's confidence in religion, education, and human perfectibility, dedicated to natural theology in the widest sense of that term, the lectures were to address the true knowledge of God, that is, of the being, nature, and at attributes of the infinite, as well as the knowledge of, uh, of the nature and foundation of ethics or morals. Those high-sounding words seem to carve out a space between the is and the ought, between our knowledge of the facts of nature and our convictions about how we should act as human beings in the world. That, at any rate, is the territory in which I want to situate my talk tonight. But I approach the topic of knowledge and morality from a very particular angle, informed by developments in science, technology, and society over the past few decades, and by my own immersion in critical studies of science and law. My reflections center on the role of science in helping us to make sense of a world that seems as full of threat and uncertainty as it did to the ancients, though many of the reasons for our current malaise seem traceable to all too human activities. I'm thinking here, of course, of climate change, the result of our growing dependence on fossil fuels, but also of recent advances at the frontiers of genetic technologies, a notable example of which occurred not a 20-minute drive from here at the Roslin Institute. Added to these are a host of concerns about the scope and limits of technological intervention. For example, renewed debates on our capacity to manage nuclear power, our increasing ability to make and manipulate thinking machines, and the proliferation of digitized data sets that aggregate our hopes and memories, our friendships and preferences, and our everyday business transactions, creating for each of us, in effect, an ever more accurate virtual profile that can be tracked and monitored at levels of intrusiveness never before seen. In a few short years, we've become inured to seeing messages like this on our laptop screens. Who knows what we need and want? Amazon knows better even than our families and friends. But did we want to be known in these ways when we consented to switch our browsing habits from the neighborhood bookstore to the world's largest digital bookshelf? Whether we like it or not, the idea of revealed preferences has taken on quite another meaning under the eyes of our ever watchful electronic service providers and search engines. The question is not whether we want this kind of change or not. The question more often is, are there any limits? How should we respond as individuals and as societies to the multiple challenges posed by science and technology? What is to be done with the new threats to human liberty and well-being at a time when the old scourges of poverty, hunger, and ill health have not by any means vanished from our world. To what extent can we turn to science for answers uh, to uh, problems that science's own achievements have brought us? And above all, how should we proceed with moral choice in a world where human values have not coalesced to nearly the same extent as scientific opinion has on such matters as the structure of the human genome, the foundations of rational thought, or the causes of climate change. 
The answers to these questions require, in my view, a deeper understanding of the nature of today's public problems, of the ways in which we move between findings about the world to a collective awareness that there are things in that world that need to be dealt with, even corrected. That move from is to ought, I think, calls for a new awareness of how the presumed singularity of science can be fitted together with the perceived plurality of language, history, and culture. I want to end with some observations about the role of reason in bridging between science and values and how a cosmopolitan view of reason can help us find our way through some of today's most intransigent political entanglements. So how can we know our world? That question has perplexed some of the most sophisticated human minds for as long as our species has displayed a love of wisdom or literally a yearning for philosophy. From Plato's cave to today's search for the beginnings of time, we have tried to grasp the essential nature of our world through varied ways of knowing. Language gives us metaphors, such as the cave, the fire, the flickering shadows, not to mention the poor humans chained so they cannot turn, but can only catch a partial, distorted image of the real. Such metaphors endure, they invite rethinking. Yeats channeled Plato, turning fire to water with his own poetic metaphor of a spume that plays upon a ghostly paradigm of things. But as powerful as language is, so too is the grip of measurement, the precision instrument with which science renders things visible, tangible, manipulable, through counting, calculation, and comparison. Here we are looking at a picture of the Big Bang. This is not something that Plato's cave metaphor was quite up to. This evening, I want to talk about the contradictions that have emerged between these competing ways of knowing as we try to come to grips with what some now term the grand challenges for humanity. There are persistent tensions between calculation and experience, between science and meaning, between what nature is and what culture wants, tensions that seem to be pulling human societies in different directions with profound consequences for how we imagine and claim ownership over our common future. On one hand, we can see the long march of the 20th century as a triumph of the scientific worldview, a demonstration that there is nothing that does not lend itself to experiment and observation, and the efforts of science have brought forth marvels, rendering distant things near and unseen things visible. In short order, the scientists and engineers of the past century cracked important secrets of the insides of the atom, the mechanisms of pain, the genetic code that governs life, the workings of language, and the uh, sources of pleasure, and the, of course, the structure of the human genome. They also brought us images of distant planets, deep ocean beds, the eyes of insects, the brains of amphibians, and the hidden depths of our own minds and bodies. Science has also brought new tools for making order, a translation of mysteries that once were seen as too complex, evanescent, or inscrutable, into the structured discipline of maps, charts, grids, graphs, yardsticks, and most of all, numbers. On the other hand, offsetting all this precision are repeated invitations to skepticism, reminders that in the complexity of our existence, there are often varied truthful answers to the question of how to know our world, that the varieties of human experience are innumerable and most deserve a place in the lexicon of civilization. In politics, ethics, literature, religion, music, and art, multiplicity, not univocality, is the baseline. Our views of where life is tending is no longer the singular Augustinian city on a hill, nor yet the dystopian but still singular Tower of Babel. 
Instead, we have learned through often bitter experience to accommodate a diversity of perspectives and allow for multiple readings and meanings at the same time. We discipline, canonize, standardize, even harmonize the human condition at our peril. This exuberant image by Bodis Kingeles, an artist from the Democratic Republic of Congo, captures something of the effervescence of our imaginations of the metaphoric cities that house our dreams of human cohabitation. The image was featured in a recent exhibition in Brussels dedicated to the history of the future, and that seemed to me an appropriate reason to feature it in my discussion of cosmopolitanism today. The late German sociologist Ulrich Beck liked to talk about cosmopolitanism, a word he vastly preferred to globalization. In its ordinary dictionary definition, cosmopolitanism means the quality of being, and I quote, free from local, provincial, or national ideas, prejudices, or attachments, and at home all over the world. Beck wanted his own science of sociology to move away from what he saw as a parochial ethnocentrism with methods mostly focused on national indicators and variables. Instead, he wanted a social science that took proper account of the mixed up character of the world as it meets us today in any modern city around the world. In a 2010 interview, Beck called attention to both the fears and the opportunities created by mixing together once disparate people and customs. And I quote, they don't recognize anymore the city they're living in. People feel to have no place in this new context and feel frightened by this new situation of unexcludability of the strange other. On the other hand, there is an enlightenment function as people are opening up realizing they necessarily have to deal with each other in order to find solutions to the big problems. The fear of strange, strangeness and estrangement for Beck went hand in hand, therefore, with the possibility of enlightenment, if only people would open up to one another. Beck's Germany of 2010 was not mine of 1965, when I was sent to study in Bonn by a father who retained fond memories of his own carefree student days there. I was working one summer at, at the biochemical company in the small industrial town of Leverkusen, a short train ride from Bonn. Half asleep one morning, I missed my station and got off at the next one, not realizing till I'd got lost in a maze of unknown streets that I was simply in the wrong place. I asked a woman out on her morning errands how to find my way back to the train station. She looked me up and down and asked in a scandalized tone, to the station in a nightgown? Today, the number of stairs I encounter in Germany are far fewer than back when the country was just emerging from ruin and devastation. But suspicion and estrangement once again are stirring. I wonder if Beck's cosmopolitanism his idea of enlightened dealing with the other remains, as it always has been, an unattainable city on a hill. One need not look far from where we are gathered today to find cause to wonder. If ever there was a promise of successful cosmopolitanism, Europe was to have been its epicenter. The 1957 Treaty of Rome, enacted in the period of post-war reconciliation and reconstruction, pledged its signatories to an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, a pledge renewed in the 1992 Maastricht Treaty. The motto of the European Union since 2000 has been united in diversity with its explicit commitment to a union that respects the member states' individual histories, cultures, and traditions. And yet today, on the eve of yet another historic referendum over union or exit, the British government is committed to staying in the EU only if Britain withdraws its allegiance from even the aspiration toward an ever closer union, pointing to a community of nations that no longer shares 
much appetite or will for integration. Today's international community looks like a space where even common sense efforts at lawmaking seem to leave people frustrated and reluctant to move forward. The anthropologist Clifford Goertz remarked in 1983 with what today looks like uncanny prescience, what has been well called the long conversation of mankind may be growing so cacophonous that ordered thought of any sort, much less the turning of local forms of legal sensibility into reciprocal commentaries mutually deepening may become impossible. With all of the pressures to fly apart, science was the institution we trusted most to bring people together under a flag of shared understanding. All other things could vary with context and circumstance. Scientific knowledge was the only constant. Deny anything else as having universal reach or foundation, but not the power of science to decree how things are. In a world of persistent doubt, distrust, skept and skepticism, science would be the one force that could make us believe together and perhaps overcome division. Scientists themselves saw this as a saving grace, repeatedly looking to the great discoveries and inventions of the past century as ways out of the binds of hostility and division. The astronomer Carl Sagan acclaimed the US space program for its ability to erase human politics, allowing us to think on what he called a scale of worlds that renders human strife and sparring inconsequential, as he put it. When international scientific efforts succeeded in mapping and sequencing the human genome, Francis Collins, then the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, went around giving a speech about the 10 most noteworthy things we had learned from the project. Topmost on his list of greatest hits from the Human Genome Project was that humans are fundamentally all alike. There is no longer any base for ethnic or racial difference. If science has such power to submerge difference, then why do we remain so far apart on matters where science should long since have brought us together? There is no better case with which to explore this question than climate change. This is an issue that scientists first brought to the world's attention, one on which they have been tirelessly working for more than 25 years with growing conviction that their predictions and projections are right and an increasing sense of urgency that people and policymakers must act now if we are to avoid disaster and disruption on a global scale. Reigning political science theories of the late 20th century predicted that such a strong factual consensus would help create an epistemic community that would cooperate across divisions of narrow national self-interest and find common solutions. Successful international treaties, such as the Montreal Protocol on the regulation of ozone-depleting chemicals, were offered by way of precedent and example but politics in the climate case defied scientists' predictions and political analysts' optimism. International responses have been, until very recently, incoherent, hesitant, and in my own country, downright resistant. What accounts for the gap between scientific cons consensus and lack of a political will to act? A popular explanation is climate denialism. People who hold this view point to the record of the fossil fuel industry in funding shoddy research uh, that became a rallying point for those who wish to do nothing in the face of mounting, compelling, reliable scientific evidence. Influential works have been written by historians and others documenting these nefarious doings and suggesting that what we need to do to correct the problem is to educate people better on the facts of the matter. This account is true enough as far as it goes. Industries such as oil and gas, and for that matter, biotechnology, nuclear power, pharmaceuticals, and a host of others do buy science 
and it would be naive to deny that they do. But the purposeful creation of a dissenting minority is not enough to explain why the world has found it so hard to act in the face of so much factual certainty from the scientific community. Climate change, as I've said, is the epitome of the kind of problem that seems to demand the long, mutually deepening conversation of mankind, whose impossibility Clifford Gertz deplored. It calls for governance on scales larger than the local, the national, or the regional. Yet the so-called climate consensus pushed the world toward a model of governance that overlooked important differences of meaning and value accorded to the facts of climate science by people situated in different regions of the world with very different understandings of what was at stake and how international governance would affect their futures and those of their progeny, societies, and nations. And these meanings were by no means convergent. Let's look at some examples. One group of nations that had previously had no economic or political clout in world governance discussions consisted of small island nations whose existence all agreed would be severely compromised by climate change. Indeed, the lowest lying of these, like Kiribati, depicted here, faced almost certain extinction. Their claim to special treatment was based in part on blamelessness. They had contributed nothing to climate change, and in part on a notion of existential risk, the prospect of total annihilation. By and large, those claims were heard and acknowledged in international negotiations. It would not, after all, cost rich countries all that much to resettle 50,000 Marshall Islanders. This was within the realm what, of what proponents of more stringent climate policy deemed economically feasible. Harder questions came, however, from large developing nations whose residents questioned the very viability of the terms in which climate scientists were conducting their appraisals. While the work of making scientific consensus proceeded apace in the secluded, seemingly apolitical meetings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, doubts were germinating in the minds of observers outside the rich countries about the ways in which the building of scientific agreement took note of or overlooked their framings of the problem. One line of criticism focused on the object that climate science chose to put at the center of its investigations, greenhouse gases, or more simply still, carbon. A group of critics spearheaded by the Indian environmentalists, the late Anil Agarwal and his successor Sunita Narayan, both heads of the Center for Science and Environment in Delhi, called attention to the fact that carbon may have the same physical composition everywhere, but that its meaning in people's lives is far from being the same. A quantum of carbon emitted as a gas from the tailpipe of a sport utility vehicle in the United States, they argued, was not and should not be set equal to the same quantum of carbon emitted from a smallholder farmer's rice paddy or dairy farm. The former, they said, were luxury emissions, deriving from activities that sustain lifestyles, but not lives. The latter were subsistence emissions required by the poor to eke out a living. If a carbon market were to be constructed, Agarwal and Narayan urged, it should be based on a morally grounded stratification of carbon into different pricing systems that take account of these differences in the way that the same thing in purely scientific terms slots into forms of life that are worlds apart. So here are two energy systems that illustrate the point about carbon being worlds apart. That is a nuclear power plant in northern Wales, and this is, a, you could call it a biogas generator or whatever. It's in, the village, in a village near 
Kajuraho, which may be well known to some of you as a major archaeological site in India, uh, and those little tile-like things sitting up on the rooftop that you see there um, are the classic cow dung patties that uh, many Indian uh, rural uh, residents still use as their only fuel. So such a division of carbon into different categories of meaning, as they urged, was also warranted in their view because of the historical inequalities that had made rich countries rich enough through centuries of colonial exploitation. But from the standpoint of the IPCC scientists and economists, as well as northern climate policymakers, their argument fell on deaf ears. An interesting exchange that occurred in 2006 at a showing of an inconvenient truth, former US Vice President Al Gore's climate change documentary illustrates the level of incomprehension between North and South. I quote from a report by the British journalist Camilla Toulmin, and she said this, you may recall, she's addressing Al Gore, she's addressing the Vice President, you may recall that in the Q&A session after your tour de force, I asked you about the connection between climate change and global justice, and in particular, are there any grounds for some kind of compensatory mechanism to provide redress for people who have been badly hit by climate change, even though they are the least responsible for carbon emissions? The question seemed to catch you by surprise. The surprise, of course, is that there was any surprise. It attests to the fact that knowing something is not the same as making sense of it. On the matter of meaning, these two interlocutors were as far apart as the IPCC and Agarwal and Narayan. Another kind of questioning came from critics who sensed that climate governance, as imagined by the IPCC experts, values life in terms that fail to take account of local meanings. Much of the discussion of how to think about a post-climate world has been couched in the language of sustainability. That term derives from the 1987 report, Our Common Future, authored by the Brundtland Commission for the United Nations in the lead up to the 1992 Environmental Summit in Rio de Janeiro. The report introduced the famous definition of sustainable development Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 30 years of experience and analysis have shown the terms to be deeply, irreducibly ambigu ambiguous, although under the label of sustainability science, scientists are seeking to reclaim the idea as their own as a univocal practice in science. For our purposes, though, what demands attention is the set of meanings that have tended to become submerged in a climate debate that is also intimately bound up with the discourse on sustainability. To illustrate, a major scientific conference I took part in last summer in the lead up to the 21st Conference of Parties in Paris in December was called Our Common Future Under Climate Change in explicit allusion to the Brundtland Report. While preparing its report, the Brundtland Commission held a number of hearings around the world, and the report includes some representative quotations. One eloquent statement came from a Brazilian speaker. We don't know from the report whether young or old, man or woman, only that it is a voice from the Amazon region. It is, however, a striking piece of lay philosophizing with an emotive depth that one rarely finds in academic writing. You talk very little about life. You talk too much about survival. It is very important to remember that when the possibilities for life are over, the possibilities for survival start. And there are peoples here in Brazil, especially in the Amazon region, who still live and these people that still live don't want to reach down to the level of survival. The, the italics, the emphasis is in the original. What is this speaker trying to say in drawing such a categorical distinction between life and survival? I don't think he had read Agamben. 
Life here seems to mean the experiential quality of being alive in a web of meaning that gives value to a person's embodied existence. This is, if you will, a humanist's vision of life. Survival, by contrast, seems to refer to science's abstracted gaze, a vision that aggregates humanity with little or no concern for individual lives, a gaze that might indeed be inclined to sacrifice any number of individual lives for the sake of a grander ideology of the survival of the species. This is why survival begins when the possibilities for life are over. Coupled to a Darwinian mindset, one can imagine the idea of survival as applying to a kind of lifeboat ethics to a world facing climate catastrophe. The weakest will be sacrificed in order to save the strong so that humanity survives at any cost. No wonder this speaker worries about reaching down to the level of survival. These reactions from around the world suggest that climate denial is a far more complex phenomenon than scientists may have acknowledged. For years, it was a truism in liberal policy circles that anthropogenic climate change was a fact and the only morally right response, therefore, was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as fast as possible. Gradually, it came to be accepted as a further matter of fact that developing countries should, quote, do their share, unquote, and that the proper unit of analysis for calculating cuts was the nation state. But, particularly outside the United States, it is not the fact of anthropogenic climate change that critics chose to target. Rather, it was the meaning of the observed facts and claims that remained deeply contested. Most of all, people took issue with the ontological flattening that treated all emission store sources as identical, producing a tradable, marketable commodity that erased entire histories of exploitation and uneven economic and human development. That is the criticism shown in the famous Yo Amigo cartoon reproduced here. The Paris Conference of Parties may have been a breakthrough event, not because it marked finally a comprehensive international acknowledgement of an extremely urgent global problem, but because it suggested a backing off from the idea that climate change is a problem for which every nation and every individual is equally responsible. The policy concept through which a deal was secured sounds bland and technical in principle, yet another example of international policy speak. But the idea behind the so-called intended nationally determined contributions, or INDCs, made important concessions to the principle of cosmopolitanism. It broke the chain of inevitability at several crucial links by conceding that nations could set their own baselines from, uh, from which emissions would be reduced, the time frame for reductions, the scope and coverage of their pledges, and the methodology to be used for calculating emissions. Much more loosely structured than the old idea of a cap and trade agreement, this more flexible approach counts on transparency, comparability, and periodic checking and revision, in short, on moral persuasion, to achieve what previously was thought to be an objective goal answerable only to science and economics. There is, of course, a danger that all the pledges will prove insufficient, as critics are already charging. Yet, once launched down the road of mutual promise-making and promise-keeping, Countries may find it politically easier and morally more responsible to ratchet up their INDCs than to buy into a framework that sought to impose what many felt was an amoral equality of obligation on everyone in the world. The link in the earlier conceptual approach that received perhaps the sharpest jolt was the automatic conversion of carbon emissions into economic instruments that turned nature into a market. Of course, as Donald McKenzie of this university has elegantly shown, there never was anything automatic about the carbon market. 
it took great ingenuity to make very different things, such as a combined heat and power plant in Edinburgh and a refrigerant plant in Kuzhou City in China's Zhejiang province to look sufficiently alike so that they could participate in buying and selling emission credits. The attack on emissions trading came from a, an unexpected and unlikely quarter. Pope Francis, a person of immense moral standing as an authentic spokesperson for the poor, issued on May 24, 2015, an encyclical on care for our common home. I wonder whether the home there was juxtaposed against future in a subconscious way, but in any case, that's what it said on care for our common home, in which he denounced the very idea of carbon credits as a possible ploy which permit, permits maintaining the excessive consumption of some countries and sectors. American economists immediately deplored the Pope's naivete, his lack of economic understanding, and his failure to appreciate how markets and incentives can achieve more efficient and fair results than regulatory hammers. But it's worth noting that the Pope in 2015 put his authority behind a point that others, such as India's Agarwal and Narayan, had been making some 25 years before. This then could be seen as one of those moments when the long conversation of mankind finally did reach some kind of mutually deepening reciprocity. The Pope served, in effect, as an ethical translation agent between developing and developed countries on the limitations of technique and on the difference between can-do and should-do approaches to making things the same in a disparate world. The end effect of a quarter century of back-and-forth negotiation was to make plain the need for cosmopolitanism in a very particular sense. Developed countries were forced to acknowledge that mitigating climate change could not simply be a matter of applying mathematical rationality to reducing emissions or fostering markets. Developing countries had to accept for their part that their desire for growth could not be met without considering the world's need to transition to a no-carbon future. Airborne carbon in the process revealed its hybrid nature not mere matter nor pure morality tale, but a repository of past mistakes and future hopes, an essential ally, but also an agent provocateur in the project of human betterment, and a thing whose ontology and whose moral status needed to be sorted out together before nations could reason productively what to do about it. Climate change, of course, is a very special kind of public problem, urgent, unwished for, physically and politically uncontained, and for its, because of its chaotic and unpredictable nature, beneficial to almost nobody, maybe to the insurance industry. One can ask whether any other issues confronting the world today demand the same kind of cosmopolitan understanding as is required for dealing with greenhouse gases. My own view is that many features of this story are actually of more gener generic relevance. Both agricultural biotechnology and the new debates surrounding gene editing raise similarly complex questions about how to act in a world that we are changing with the fruits of science and technology. Let's consider biotechnology first as the issue that has been with us longer. <laughs> Beginning in the 1980s, regulatory agencies such as the US Food and Drug Administration started approving genetically modified crops, conventionally known as GMOs, for widespread use. Today, the lion's share of corn, soybean, and cotton grown in the United States, that is maize, soybean, and cotton, uh, is genetically engineered to be resistant to insects or tolerant to herb herbicides. As with climate modeling, there is a strong scientific consensus underlying these developments. Only whereas scientists find the climate to be changing in dangerously risky ways, in the case of GMOs, they overwhelmingly agree that the products of 
technological intervention are thoroughly reliable and safe. Despite this scientific consensus, public opinion the world over, and even to some extent in the United States, remains sharply divided and on the whole critical toward expanding the number of GMOs or encouraging their widespread use. Industry and policy reactions have been sharply critical of these public views. This is one example of the author Robert Palberg and his book Starved for Science. Uh, and these works accuse lay people of harboring uninformed prejudices against GMOs, charging Europe in particular with foisting unreasoning rich world prejudices on hungry developing countries and at the limit, fiercely opposing moves that would distinguish GMOs from conventional crops through labeling or other similar devices. This label from the top of an ice cream container by the popular manufacturer Ben & Jerry's, briefly the purveyor in this country of the flavor Cool Britannia, uh, tells a tangled tale of science, law, policy, and public opinion. The convoluted text on the label, which you probably can't read, but um, I'd be happy to send it to anyone who's interested. It tries to reassure en environmentally aware consumers that Ben & Jerry's uses GMO-free milk and cream without running afoul of government policy that says such a claim would be false and misleading. So instead of saying we do not use these products, it says we oppose recombinant bovine growth hormone uh, the family farmers who supply our milk and cream pledge not to treat their cows with our BGH. And then it says the FDA has said there's no significant difference between milk treated and not treated with recombinant bovine growth hormone. Since in the science-based view of American regulators such as the FDA, there is no difference between milk treated with conventional and GM bovine growth hormone, to suggest otherwise would create an untenable impression of risk, where science says there is none. Ben and Jerry's would be guilty of false advertising, violating scientific truth. But this black and white logic, firmly reliant on scientific proofs of safety, glosses over the moral dimension of GMOs. So GMOs are a natural moral hybrid, much the way the carbon in greenhouse gases is. Concerns that people have raised throughout the world range widely. Some are afraid that GM agriculture, like the Green Revolution before it, will disproportionately benefit big agribusiness, leading to economically and psychologically unsustainable pressures on small farmers. Some resist the idea of farmers' age-old control of their seed supplies slipping away as a result of GMO manufacturers' property rights claims. Some fear, that the loss of some fear the loss of biodiversity if GMOs massively take over from conventional crops. Some worry about the effects of genetic engineering on animals, from cows to salmon. And of course, some do remain convinced that the safety claims advanced by industry rest on science that has not been fully vetted and hence remains not proven. To take this entire complex of economic, social, ethical, political, and epistemic concerns and dismiss them with the label anti-science takes freedom of choice away from citizens and farmers. It reduces what should be a rich and reasoned debate on values to an impoverished framing that ju does justice to neither values nor science. The last example I want to talk about is the technique known as gene editing that has recently grabbed headlines on both sides of the Atlantic. Known by its technical name of CRISPR-Cas9, this method of cutting and pasting DNA corrects what could be seen as typos in the genomes of organisms, the structures metaphorically known as books of life. Cheap, easy, and versatile, CRISPR already promises to bring major changes to the practices of agriculture and biomedicine, but in the process, the technique raises some of the same issues that have long plagued genetic engineering when applied to human beings. 
Central to the debate is the question whether our societies should allow gene editing if the altered traits could be passed on to the next generation. This process of germline gene editing is currently prohibited by formal or informal policy in many countries, but should that consensus change, and if so, at whose behest and with what ethical protections? A high-level scientific meeting held in Washington, D.C. last December proposed a de facto moratorium during which scientists could figure out how far to go with the technique. But there are already signs that this debate, too, will be channeled into the framework of cost-benefit analysis that scientists have continually applied to assessing the merits of their own work. This is not surprising, given the dearth of public voices or even informed perspectives from outside the sciences in question at the Washington summit. This was a summit designed by elite scientists, not the human societies whose genes they were considering editing. Accordingly, there is once again a good chance that util utilitarian logics will suppress or deny the large differences that exist among cultural and religious groups about the pros and cons of tinkering with human nature and the nature of the human. What finally is the way forward out of all the binds and conundrums of our complex, ambivalent, situated encounters with science and technology? In Edinburgh, the seat of one enlightenment, it seems particularly appropriate to call for a second enlightenment, one informed by ideas of restraint and humility that take account of those things we do not know and cannot judge. And some of these results come out of the very Science Studies Unit, whose 50th anniversary will be celebrated this year. So let us remind ourselves first why science was trusted to be good for us in the first place, and recall that those were virtues of modesty, not overpromise. Skepticism, humility, experimentalism, and civic engagement. Keeping those virtues in mind, we can chart a way forward for humanity that acknowledges the centrality of science and technology as instruments we would not wish to do without. At the same time, it's up to us to keep them in their rightful places, not beyond questioning, required to admit and explain their errors, accountable for false turns, and not claiming exclusive rights to determine human futures. We come then to the ingredients of the second enlightenment, which begin by stopping the myth-making about science. This stance demands, too, that we acknowledge the intertwining of knowledge and norms instead of subordinating either to the other. Once seen, that interweaving provides the groundwork for the kind of cosmopolitanism I have been speaking about tonight, an attitude of openness in reasoning together, such as Beck advocated, with the civility and mutual understanding that Goethe would have wished for, and in speaking with one another, to have the grace to know when not to judge, because one's own foundations are seen to be too insecure and provisional, if not actually misguided. As Wittgenstein fam famously said, whereof one cannot speak, thereof must one be silent. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, you think that uh, rationality enjoys the same degree of universality as scientific method does? Well, I think that uh, the question is more about what kind of rationality. Scientific method, I think, has a claim to being unitary in a way that we don't associate with reason. But I think no societies I know operate without some sense of what rationality means. It's just that with rationality, we don't have any compunctions 
adding adjectives. I mean, so people say emotional rationality or psychological rationality or whatever, that is some kind of um, reasoned strain of argument can be given for why one feels a certain way. Uh, the same is not true of scientific method where, the, where it's a much more constrained thing. So you know, I think the idea of rationality or of reason, uh, I mean, you know, making a claim that it's universal is not my style, but, but I think it's pretty widespread that people, societies and cultures have inbuilt ideas of what's reason. Thanks very, very much for such an interesting lecture. I wonder whether you think um, the citizens of the United States are sufficiently rational uh, to be able to arrive at a judgment on what is in their food if they are told a little bit more about it, as is proposed in the state of Vermont. But apparently, um, uh, the U.S. Senate doesn't agree. <laughs> well, I mean, as you know, what what institutional rationality is is different from what uh, individual rationality is. That is, institutions operate according to win lose strategic considerations that may have nothing whatsoever to do with what they believe. Um, I. Uh, I personally don't know, have no idea if some of our leading presidential candidates right now espouse in their heart of hearts the beliefs that they hold in public because they uh, correctly know that these things have been um, given the power to move multitudes in some way. Actually, I, you know, the, the poll results suggest that it may be a, a very elaborate game in both directions that the public doesn't believe many of the things that the public is attributed with believing either. But in any event, there is a political dance and a game going on. Uh, what, the, what the Senate believes, or what the Republican members of the Senate believe about something like climate change is um, quite open to question. I suppose if they were Catholics, they might go and confess, but we have no way of knowing. Um, one can notice shifts in discourse. So it used to be that people uh, on the American right were far more forthright in saying that they simply don't believe climate change is happening, that it's anthropogenic, et cetera. So lately that's been displaced somewhat by a rhetoric of not being scientists and hence not being able to judge. To me that signals uh, a, a discomfort with holding a belief that seems too out of kilter with scientific consensus. That is, it's an eva evasionary tactic to say, well, I just don't understand this. Whereas uh, to flat out deny it seems um, more problematic. Is it a follow-up then? No, it's a question. Okay. I probably should have explained more fully what I meant. Um, in the state of Vermont, they have passed a law, I think you noticed, that but will require North American food manufacturers to state on the label if it contains genetically modified foods or not. And the Senate is currently trying to pass a law preventing the state of Vermont from doing this. Uh, and in the course of the debate, in the last couple of days, the senators claimed that Americans will be unduly confused by having this amount of information on their food labels. Whereas, of course, we in Europe have had this for some time. Now, I, it was, I, I put it a bit ironically, but I mean, it does seem that in the United States, not only in relation to climate change, but even GM foods, there's an active attempt to suppress democratic deliberation on yes, well, technological about, I mean, influence. I mean, there, there's no disagreement whatsoever. The, the uh, label that I showed you, the Ben and Jerry's label, is, of course, from the state of Vermont. That's where the company 
is situated. And in that state, there's been an ongoing battle between the federal government, the executive branch, and now with Congress over this labeling issue. And yes, it is quite remarkable that that argument about how they're protecting the public works. Um, California has tried to get around it in some other states by having referenda. But what's happened in those referenda thus far is that um, huge amounts of lobbying about the price of food rising has actually uh, led to negative votes. So in that sense, democracy has spoken that they would rather, that people would rather have the cheaper food than the labels. Uh, so, you know, it's an example of the multiple rationalities at work. But what do I think of the argument that Americans will be confused? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's laughable. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to ask um, you to re reflect a little bit more on the role of markets, which um, you mentioned in the, in the talk, which um, I found it very interesting you putting um, uh, Argawal and Narayan and Pope Francis into dialogue. And um, in the quote you gave from Pope Francis, he seemed to um, suggest that the creation of markets around carbon, for example, is implicated in this process of, um, as you put it, the univocalization of, of uh, meaning, a reduction of meaning uh, to, to one, uh, one kind. I wonder if you think that's a sort of necessary function of markets, or if in fact uh, there could be, a, say, a plurality of local markets which could respect the different kinds of meaning and uh, practices uh, that, um, uh, that constitute um, um, you know, what carbon means in that environment. Yeah, I mean, there's you're in a way answering the question as you put it, because there's nothing intrinsic to markets anyway, I and mean, they're among the most constructed things. But in a market, you do have to make a decision about what to hold still and render equivalent to something else. And most markets have ways around those equivalence settings, right? I mean, so you can think about the brand names with which people uh, separate Prosecco from Champagne, for instance, so that they will not count as the same thing for purposes of a common market. Um, I actually once intervened with some colleagues in Britain um, in trying to get the WTO to get off of a rigid idea of how GMOs uh, were all the same regardless of what kind of risk assessment was done by pointing out that there could be a stratification of GMOs into those about which one had very firm information and those about which one had less. And maybe there could be a sliding scale of different degrees of democratic engagement, uh, sort of uh, the, the opposite, in other words, of the degree of information. So high certainty, more, more scientific consensus driven, low, si low certainty and more democratic engagement driven. But of course that would have required them to think of their market in a completely different way. And besides with the US as one of the litigants, it wasn't going to be easy to bring about a completely different mindset anyway. So, I mean, I think the point is that the, the moment in a market where one is setting things to be equal to other things, is either treated as a technical question because they simply are ontologically the same, uh, or people overlook it and forget it and you know, no longer remember that there was that kind of settlement that went on. And I think what I'm trying to say is that um, markets are always already political and one needs to restore that to view if one is to have a market that operates as a an instrument of justice as well as an instrument of efficiency. Yes, uh, uh, about midway back. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, hello, I really like your talk. I wanted to bring it, bring it back home a little bit. On the subject of climate change, as you know, there are many skeptical views on climate change in the United States, most likely for economic reasons, which then um, seep through through the media onto people. As you, as you might know, our government here is quite climate skeptic as well. 
ma many notable members of the, of the government do not believe in human-created climate change. So there is a lot of mistrust I've heard in, amongst people when it comes to scientists. The, the policy leaders might be because of economic reasons, but these, these, economic, these are explained to people through the media by, by means of distrust of interests of the scientists. So it, what might be a good idea, part of the source of this distrust is that the scientists themselves are not leading with the example to bring it home this university has very large investments in non-renewable energies. And there has been a 12-year battle by, by the student body for, to get the university to divest from these, from these um, investments. Would you support this student, this student effort to get the university to lead with the example and divest? So uh, it's, uh, I didn't, don't know exactly what you meant by bringing it home, but you may know that at Harvard there has been a comparable effort. Um, and uh, in confessional mode, I will say I did not sign it. Um, but that's not for reasons of opposing the move. Uh, I just think that my own um, role as an academic can be more effectively played in other ways than by signing petitions in a, um, in a sort of follow the group way. It, uh, it does dilute one's ability to take positions that are um, in some way more thoughtful. Um, You know, there's, a, there's a strong consensus at Harvard that Harvard ought to divest from coal and that one shouldn't necessarily lump all fossil fuel sources together and that uh, if one imagines a stepwise pathway into the future, the, a low carbon, no carbon future is not going to come about immediately so that one may as well at least get rid of the most polluting things first and then... Um, from there, um, you know, use that as a ratchet eventually, I and mean, that word, as you know, is quite favored in, in policy circles. Um, I think if there were such a proposal on the table, then um, possibly I would go along with that. Um, the, uh, in the meantime, I think that my energies are better devoted to deconstructing the rather flabby arguments for why one should not divest. Uh, that I find a better use of my own uh, legally trained ingenuity. In the far back. So the unitary ni nature of science that you discuss seems to lend it an almost totemic power in our society which lends itself to abuse, some of which we've been seeing discussed today. Uh, there have been a few examples, though, in the UK recently where um, doctors or experts on drug addiction have spoken up against the use of their scientific analyses by politicians for ends that they feel are not justified. Do you think that the kind of, there is an ivory tower element of uh, our science education that needs investigation or challenging to bring more scientists into the public realm in such that kind of case? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we don't have, I mean, it's a very interesting question. We don't have time to discuss it in detail, but I think that there is, uh, you know, as I've discussed in some of my work, uh, there are c cultural particularities to the ways in which um, uh, people in the power world relate to people in the knowledge world. One of the striking things about Britain is that uh, the word expert is not used nearly so much as the word scientist. I mean, so there's, it's like there's a, 
one-to-one -one relationship between science, uh, pure and simple, and its transmission into power, uh, whereas there's much more of a uh, sense that there's a separate domain called expertise that is a mishmash of various things um, on the American side, and not uh, not, not coincidentally, maybe, we've uh, taken more pains in our legislative apparatus to try to ensure that um, uh, a sort of overt disregard of things like what, a, what a, an advisor advises will not happen. Now, this is not to say that there's more or less corruption on, you know, in any system. It's just that the pathways are different. And so what one would need in the way of protections here uh, would, I think, uh, match up with, in some sense, what I've called civic epistemologies, uh, that is particular sort of cultural, uh, institutionally grounded, historically situated ways of knowing. Um, and one of the directions that British policy went off in uh, about a decade or so ago was proposing that scientific advisors uh, should take um, a, a sort of a swear and integrity oath or there should be a code of conduct for them. That idea that experts advising the US government should have a code of conduct is really not, I mean, that, and it's hard to prove a negative, but it just isn't the kind of, it isn't the way that, that the American policy world would think of a matter like that. Uh, and I think it goes, in some sense, hand in hand with um, a sense that there still is a sort of personal honor, integrity kind of idea about who a scientist is, and even when that scientist is playing a role in public. I mean, you know, these are sort of complicated things where my own sort of ethnographies of Brit British politics over many decades now have led me to have certain views, um, but for instance, people don't resign in America. They still do occasionally in Britain. I mean, there are these sort of behavioral differences uh, that go with uh, ideas of legitimacy. So that's a long-winded way of saying that how that problem that you describe would be solved in this country um, would end up being quite particular to institutional expectations and demands that are not the same as in other places. For instance, the other country that I look at a lot, Germany, doesn't have the category of sort of pure science being in an advisory role. It's much more a representative person, a person who is a scientist but, but speaking for labor or speaking for industry. And so the, the specific kind of non-hearing or refusal to go along or misappropriation that you're describing in Britain is less likely to arise uh, in the German context. Um, so, you know, it's something to have longer conversations about, but I think these are very situated questions. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. I was particularly fascinated by your remarks on the Paris Agreement and the implied contrast with the Kyoto Agreement. And if the future of humanity weren't at stake, uh, one could say, you know, this is an this 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 is an incredible quasi experiment in public policy, these two very different agreements. But of course, unfortunately, the future of humanity is at stake. So I wanted to press you to expand a little bit on how optimistic you are about Paris. Well, I don't think you really want to know how optimistic I am, Donald. <laughs> it would not be a very interesting answer. Um, but the um, but if you think in law and in institutional terms, and particularly of international law, you could see Kyoto as having been a natural experiment. It didn't work. I mean, so, you know, one can't go back and say, well, that was obviously a better kind of agreement because it was binding. I mean, this is why in the talk I said 
that critics are already saying that these promises that people are putting on the table um, are not enough. But there's a lot of experience from um, the mutually monitoring kinds of agreements in all kinds of domains. I mean, whether it's, I mean, you could think of it as Foucauldian in a sense. I mean, that is the panopticon is being created at the international level and then everybody's watching everybody else. And, you know, it's, uh, you could say, for instance, I mean, of course, it's a complicated territory. We're talking about states. That what right have we to talk about states when there are people like Gates who are states? Uh, and so you make up this agreement, but it brings forth the Gates state to throw a lot of money into the pot. And interestingly to me, because America has sort of refused to acknowledge America is very happy about acknowledging the one, one billion, the one in China. America is quite unwilling to talk to or about the other billion in India. Uh, but Gates is making nice with Narendra Modi. And you can have, I mean, you know, this is why optimism, pessimism is a binary that I don't want to get into because, you know, maybe for the future of humanity in a certain sense, having Narendra Modi be able to do something in India to clean up the Carbon Act would be beneficial for humanity as a whole. If he does it by suppressing or killing democracy in India, you know, I'm not sure that that's wildly good for the future of humanity. Uh, but in any event, uh, the, the point is that already the Gates and the other rich donor, private donor action is an example of something that this more flexible framework may be generating. I mean, I don't think that any of the things on the table have proved to be so rapidly working. So at least something that gets the countries to buy in as opposed to buy out, which is what we've had, had up to now, strikes me as incrementally better than the stalemate that we've had up to this point. Um, I mean, you know, I've heard the sort of French leading people. I mean, just recently I heard a talk by the French ambassador to the United States. And of course, he is full of rah-rah enthusiasm about how enlightenment did happen, and it happened in the City of Light. I'm not that optimistic. We've had a very important lecture, disturbing in many ways, but uh, I think also in other ways affirming there is an element of, of hope, there is a sense in this notion of a second enlightenment that we can recover cosmopolitan values, we can recover a sense of humility and civility, and that perhaps we can be better than we are. One of Professor Jasanoff's great gifts as a scholar and as a writer is her, her ability to write clearly, gracefully, eloquently on very complex issues. And she certainly has shown us that this evening. Could you please join me in thanking Professor Jasanoff both for her talk and for her responses to our questions.